A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to Hindi News Analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy for the date 1st of August 2022. The list of articles we are going to discuss today is displayed on the screen. You can go through it. Now let's start the discussion. See this news article here. This news article talks about a state scheme called the Arunodai scheme. Today's news is that under the scheme, additional amount will be provided to beneficiaries to buy flags. Why? Because in this month, we will be celebrating our 75th Independence Day. Okay? So let us focus on the scheme now. See, Arunodai or Arunodai scheme, as I said, it is a state scheme. It was launched by the government of Assam in 2020. The name Orunodai means sunrise and it is social welfare scheme that has twin objectives. One is the economic empowerment of women and second is to bring the poor households out of the below poverty line. Under the scheme, monetary benefits are provided to the poor or economically backward households in the state. It aims to cover more than 24 lakh poor households. See, actually the beneficiaries are the women of the poor household. Women are given importance as they are the primary caretakers of the family. So, through this money, the scheme aims to provide financial assistance to the women of the family. And this is why, if there is no woman in the family, that household would be excluded from the benefit. And such beneficiaries should be a permanent resident of Assam and currently reside in Assam and their composite household income should not exceed 2 lakh per annum. So what is the monetary benefit here? A sum of rupees 1000 is provided every month through direct benefit transfer scheme. Note that from this October, the amount is increased to rupees 1250. The state government has a rationale behind this amount. It is to be used for procuring medicines, pulses, sugar and essential fruits and vegetables. So, through this financial assistance, the scheme aims to take care of health needs, nutritional needs and medical needs of a family. This is the first significance of the scheme. Secondly, it provides an assured minimum monthly cash flow to the underprivileged families. Thirdly, by fulfilling these needs, the scheme envisages poverty eradication and socio-economic inclusion. Fourthly, such unconditional cash transfers act as a recognition of women's unpaid domestic and care work. See, this amount is definitely not equivalent with women's unpaid domestic and care work. But still it offers some recognition. Okay? So that's all about this news article. In this news article, we saw about Orunodai scheme of Assam and its benefits. With these learned points, let's move on to next news article discussion. See this text and context article here. This article is about the technology powering hybrid electric vehicles. So this article is wholly about the hybrid electric vehicles shortly referred as HEV. So in this discussion, we are going to see what is a hybrid electric vehicle, how does it work, how is it different from normal electric vehicles and finally we will see some pros and cons of hybrid electric vehicle. Okay. Before that, the syllabus relevant to this article discussion is highlighted here for your reference. You can go through it. First of all, what is a hybrid? See, hybrid is something that is a mixture of two very different things, right? So, hybrid vehicle is the one that uses two or more distinct type of power. For example, submarines use diesel when surfaced and use batteries when submerged. Okay? So, it uses both battery and diesel. So, it can be called as hybrid vehicle, okay? Now, what is the hybrid electric vehicle? It is a type of hybrid vehicle that combines a conventional internal combustion engine with an electric propulsion system, okay? That's all. See, the powering mechanism of a hybrid electric vehicle is quite complex when compared to a regular internal combustion engine powered car. This is because the mechanism has both the components of electric vehicles and the conventional internal combustion engine system. When we use the components of both these electric vehicles and internal combustion engine, the complexity develops, okay? Now let's see the powering mechanism in an HEV. See, hybrid electric vehicle powering mechanism are designed to power cars in a serial 
parallel or series parallel methods. So what are these methods? Now let's see that. See, in series HEV, it uses only the electric motor to drive the wheels. Here, the internal combustion engine powers the generator which in turn recharges the battery. Okay, this is about series HEV. Now coming to parallel hybrid electric vehicle, it uses the best power source to power the vehicle based on the driving condition. Now what does this mean? It means that a parallel HEV will alternate between the electric motor and the internal combustion engine to keep the car moving. Okay. Now what is this serious parallel HEV? As the name suggests, it offers a combination of both the above models. Meaning, the combination of both the series and parallel model. Basically, it allows to split the power. Moreover, in all three designs, the battery is charged through regenerative braking technology. What is this regenerative braking technology? See, just remember, when you apply the brakes on the vehicle, some sort of energy is wasted. This wasted energy is used to recharge the car's batteries. This is called regenerative braking technology. Okay, that is when you apply the brake, the energy is regenerated. That's how you have to remember. Okay, we have seen so many examples in the news. For example, uh, Maruti Suzuki, Grand Vitara, and Toyota Urban Cruiser. They are all hybrid vehicles. Okay, now let's see some advantages in using hybrid electric vehicles. The first advantage is fuel efficiency. See, it is a major factor for most people who are considering to buy a car. Most vehicles with hybrid technology offer better fuel efficiency and more power. And this leads to the second advantage which is it has a minimum emissions. When the fuel is used efficiently, of course there will be a minimum emission. Okay. Now coming to the third advantage, it gives increased mileage. When our car is fuel efficient, it will obviously increase the mileage, right? And the factor that helps in achieving this increased mileage is the design of hybrid vehicles with reduced engine size and the car weight when compared to other vehicles. Okay. Moreover, with the increase in the total power and torque, this hybrid electric vehicles can deliver instant torque and provide high torque even at low speeds. These are the advantages. Now let's see some challenges. One of the major challenges for this vehicle that is the hybrid electric vehicles is the high cost of the vehicle. You should know why it has high cost. Because the battery which is a vital component of this vehicle increases the cost of this vehicle. And uh, we also discussed about this uh, regenerative braking system, right? This also adds to the higher cost of this vehicle. And this is a major factor because India is a price sensitive market. When the price is high, the people will be demotivated to buy any vehicles. See, we know that the automotive industry is undergoing a transition with an increasing focus on hybrid and battery electric vehicles because there are certain factors which drive the growth of the global electric vehicle market. These factors include the rise in the fossil fuel prices and the increase in the adoption of clean mobility solutions and stringent government norms for emission control drive. Okay. Finally, the strong hybrid electric vehicles will play a critical role in reducing fossil fuel consumption, carbon emissions and pollution. Additionally, it also plays critical role in creating a local EV parts manufacturing ecosystem. Okay, so it will ensure a faster and disruption free technology transition. Okay, so that's all regarding this news article. In this news article, we saw about what is hybrid and what is hybrid electric vehicles and then we saw some pros and cons regarding the hybrid electric vehicles. With these learned points, let's move on to next news article discussion. See this editorial article. This editorial article talks about the issue of public stock holdings of grains for food security purposes. See, the WTO's 12th ministerial conference took place from 12th to 17th June 2022 at World Trade Organization headquarters in Geneva. Ministers from across the world attended the conference to review the functioning of multilateral trading system. And in that, India demanded for a permanent solution for the issue of public stock holdings of grains for food security purposes. So in this backdrop, let us quickly go through some of the important points mentioned in the news article. Before that, the syllabus relevant to this news article is given here. Please go through it. So first of all, what is public stock holdings of grains? 
See, public stock holding program is a policy tool under which the government procure crops like uh, rice and wheat from farmers at minimum support price, that is MSP. Then the grains are stored and distributed to the poor people. Here, MSP is a form of market intervention by the government of India. It is the price at which the government procures certain crops from farmers. Why it is done? This is done to insure them against any sharp fall in prices. So, MSP is normally higher than the prevailing market rates, meaning it is like an indirect form of subsidy given by the government and they are sold at a low price for poor people to ensure food security. Okay, you should know why we are doing this. See, according to many reports, two-third of people of India live in poverty. Around 70% of Indian population lives on less than $2 per day. So, to address this, government distributes food grain to the people who are living below poverty line. But the World Trade Organization's Agreement on Agriculture, which we call AOA Agreement, limits the ability of a government to purchase food at MSP. Because under WTO law, such price support based procurement from farmers is considered as a trade distorting subsidy. And if the grains are supplied in excess of the permitted limit, it violates WTO regulations. According to global trade norms, a WTO member country's food subsidy bill should not breach the limit of 10% of the value of production based on the reference price of 1986 to 1988. But there is something called peace clause. See, under peace clause, countries cannot bring legal challenges against price support based procurement for food security purposes. So, India as of now has a temporary relief due to this peace clause. But the issue here is that India cannot use this clause indefinitely. Because beyond a limit, India cannot prove that it is procuring food grains only for food security purposes. So, a permanent solution to this issue is crucial. So, this is the background of the issue. Now, we shall see three perspectives of the issue. First, we shall see about why WTO considers MSP as a trade distorting subsidy. Then, we will see about India's stand on the issue. And finally, we will see about the author's perspective on the issue. Okay? Now, let's start with AOA agreement of WTO. See, under the agreement on agriculture, subsidies are categorized into two parts on the basis of their trade distorting nature. First is the green box subsidies. These are permitted subsidies because they have either no or minimal trade distorting effect. Subsidies by developing countries, most notably the US and the European Union fall under this category. There is no limit on the amount of green box subsidy as of now. The other category is amber box subsidies. They are defined under Article 6 of the Agreement on Agriculture. These subsidies have a potentially damaging effect on trade and distort the relevant market. Or in other words, WTO law prohibits countries from exporting food grain procured at subsidized prices. There is a sound economic rationale behind it. Because allowing a country to export food grain procured at subsidized prices would give that country an unfair advantage in global agricultural trade. The country concerned will sell food grain in the international market at a very low price which in turn will depress the global prices and it will have an adverse impact on the agricultural trade of other countries. Because of this reason, WTO says that the subsidies need to be gradually reduced to ensure compliance with global norms. WTO members had first negotiated these commitments at the Uruguay round of negotiations. And thereafter, it has been discussed at subsequent ministerial conference and the committee meetings of the WTO. Okay? Now, let's see the India stand. See, in the recent past, there were many uncertainties ranging from the COVID-19 pandemic to the recent Russia-Ukraine war. Especially, the Russia-Ukraine conflict has triggered a food crisis in a number of countries. India wished to extend its hand to support the countries which is currently facing food crisis. But it could not export more beyond a limit. So, during the recently concluded ministerial conference, first, India demanded the WTO to allow export of food grain from public stocks for international food aid and for humanitarian purposes. That too on a government to government basis. 
here india indirectly insisted on a permanent solution to public stock holding policy secondly india insists that it should also be allowed to export food most notably wheat from the pool of food grain procured under msp here india's concern is that it should have the policy space to hold public food stocks using the msp which is just a price support instrument so these were the india's concern now according to para 10 of Geneva Ministerial Food Security Declaration it is stated that countries may release surplus food stocks in the international market but it should be in accordance with the WTO law remember that the waiver for wheat exports is still pending it is not completely agreed upon okay also under article 93 of the WTO agreement waivers can be adopted only in exceptional circumstances but According to the author even once in a century pandemic like covid-19 was not even acknowledged as an exceptional circumstances for the ip waiver that means intellectual property waiver is restricted to only covid-19 vaccines and it does not cover diagnostics and therapeutics so there is a very narrow possibility of recognizing the ongoing war as an exceptional circumstance to adopt a waiver for wheat exports from public stocks okay so what the author tries to say is that even covid-19 is not an exceptional circumstance to avail wto waiver so india cannot use the reason of ongoing war for wheat exports from public stocks okay that's it now let's see the author's perspective See developed countries have historically opposed India's public stock holding program because they argue that India might divert some of its public stock to the international market depressing global prices. If India actively pushes for exporting food from its official granaries then it will provide a new opportunities for these developed countries to strongly oppose India on public stock holding issue. So according to the author India should revisit its stand on asking for a waiver for wheat exports from its public stock holding so instead of delaying the permanent solution for the public stock holding program India should have a crystal clear negotiations at the WTO by adding new objectives because shifting goal posts might result in falling between two stools okay so that's all regarding this news article this editorial article we saw about the public stock holding program of india wto's agreement on agriculture india stand on food grains exports and finally we saw about the author's perspective regarding this issue with these key learned points let's move on to next news article discussion see this article This article mentions about Lingayat. According to the article, the Akila Parada Veera Shaiva Mahasabha have demanded the Karnataka government to recommend the inclusion of Veera Shaiva Lingayat on the central OBC list. While this is going on one side, Congress leader Rahul Gandhi has visited certain powerful Lingayat madas in central Karnataka. Let's not get deep inside the issue here instead let's quickly learn about Veera Shaiva or Lingayats Firstly who are the Lingayats See the Lingayats were a religious community and they preeminently observe the tenets of Shaiva religion that is it is a sect devoted to the worship of Shiva but now this sect has developed into a caste they are also known as Lingavans Shiva Bakas and Veera Shaivas But among these the preferred name is Veera Shaivas that is why in the news article they are referred with this name they possess a non caste religion they acknowledge the supremacy of the vedas but they dissent from the performance of the sacrifices this religion is predominant in the present day karnataka now talking about the origin of lingayatism see the tradition of lingayatism is known to have been founded by social reformer and philosopher basavanna in 12th century in karnataka while it is debatable whether basavanna founded the sect or simply reorganized an existing order there is no doubt that under his leadership the community acquired the form of well organized structured mass movement Followers of the sect continue to revere him as the founder and prime philosopher of their religion. Now we shall see about Basavanna. 
See, he is one of the prominent social reformers. He had egalitarian views. That is, he believed in the principle that all people are equal and deserve equal rights and opportunities. He believed in the enlightenment and welfare of all including the people belonging to the so-called low caste or outcast that is the persons who are rejected by the society as untouchables. Another important reform proclaimed by him was the remarriage of widows. This is also one of the biggest bones of contention with brahmanas who were opposed to it. He even established the Anubhava Mantapa which means spiritual parliament. In this Anubhava Mantapa, hundreds of sharanas, men and women took part in the spiritual discussions. Sharanas means those who had dedicated themselves to serve humanity and God. All of them together condemned the categorization of the society based on caste, subcaste and its various connotations including untouchability. They gave wisdom to everyone through their vachana writings. Vachana means poetry. By this they established a Kalyana Rajya. Here Kalyana means welfare, Rajya means state. So they established a welfare state. Okay, so this is about the article. In this article discussion, we saw about Lingayats, the origin of Lingayatism, and finally we saw about Basavanna. With these key learned points, let's move on to next news article. See this article here. This article talks about rescue center that has been helping injured and rescued wildlife. It is significant because it is the first of its kind by the Tamil Nadu Forest Department. This rescue center is located inside the Gindi National Park in Chennai. The article states that the pelican with an injured wing and a monkey which was being bitten by dogs were rescued by the officials. The officials also constructed a new post-mortem room. This news is significant because we rarely see such rescue center exclusive for animals. You can quote about these kind of rescue centers in your main answer writing regarding biodiversity conservation. It will be unique. Okay. Now coming to the Gindi National Park, it is the eighth smallest national park in India and it is one of the very few national parks located inside a city. For instance, Gindi National Park is situated inside Chennai. Okay. The park is an extension of a ground surrounding Rajpavan, formerly known as Gindi Lodge, which is the official residence of the governor of Tamil Nadu. Okay. This green patch with a multitude of trees, scrubs and herbs purifies the air and also acts as a habitat for a wide number of faunal species. Though this tiny area is surrounded by a concrete jungle and human habitations that exert intense biotic pressure, the biodiversity inside the park is amazing. It is one of the last remnants of tropical dry evergreen forest of the Coromandel coast. The ecosystem consists of the rare tropical dry evergreen scrub and thorn forest that receive about 1200 millimeters of rain annually. About 350 species of plants have been identified so far including trees, scrubs, climbers, herbs and grasses. Also know that Gindi Snake Park is located next to the Gindi National Park. It gained statutory recognition as a medium zoo from the Central Zoo Authority in 1995. Here one can see king cobras, pythons, vipers and other reptiles. Okay. See the ecosystem services provided by this kind of protected area have immense value. They include sequestration of carbon dioxide, release of oxygen, conserving soil, preventing floods, mitigating climate change, improving water quality, generation of employment opportunities, revenue generation in addition to recreational, aesthetic and spiritual benefits. Okay. So that's all regarding this news article. In this news article, we saw about a rescue center located inside the Gindi National Park. Then we saw in brief about the National Park and Gindi Snake Park. Then we finally ended our discussion by seeing the ecosystem services provided by this kind of protected areas. Okay. With these learned points, let's move on to next part of our news article discussion, which is preliminary practice question discussion. Today we have two questions. Look at the first question. Schemes are displayed on one side and the associated governments are displayed on another side. We have to find the correct pair. Statement 1. Lakshmir Bandhar, West Bengal, Griha Aadhar Scheme, Goa, Orunodai Scheme, Azam. Look at the first pair, it is correct. Lakshmir Bandhar is a state scheme of West Bengal. 
It provides an assured monthly income to the female members of all families of the state to improve their financial condition and promote women empowerment. All female residents aged between 25 to 60 years are eligible. Women from scheduled caste or scheduled tribes households gets rupees 1000 per month and other women get rupees 500 per month. The second scheme, Griha Aadhar scheme, it is also correctly matched. It is a scheme of Goa government. The objective of the scheme is to address the problem of spiraling prices and to provide support to the homemakers from middle, lower middle and poor section of the society. This will help them to maintain a reasonable standard of living for their families. Under this scheme, a monthly disbursement of amount of rupees 1500 is provided every month directly at the hands of homemakers. Now coming to the third pair, it is also correct. This we saw in the discussion itself, right? So the answer here will be option C, all three pairs. Now look at the second question, it is regarding Lingayats. Consider the following statements about the Lingayats. Statement 1, they bury their dead. Statement 2, they are great believers in the caste system, especially in theory of purity and pollution. Statement 3, they are against child marriage and favor widow remarriage. We have to find the correct statement here. See, statement 1 is correct because they believe that on death, the devotee will be united with Shiva and will not return to this world. So, they ceremonially bury their dead. Statement 2, it is wrong because as we saw in the discussion, the Lingayats challenged the idea of caste and the pollution attributed to certain groups by Brahmanas. Statement 3, it is correct because they were against the post-puberty marriage and favored the remarriage of widows. So, the correct answer for this question is option D, 1 and 3 only. The main questions based on today's discussion is displayed on the screen. You can write the answer and post it in the comment section. If you like the video, hit the like button, post your comments and share the video with your friends. And don't forget to subscribe Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel. Thanks for watching.